What sorcery is this? Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome back once again. And I've got to tell you, I am beyond excited right now because I get the opportunity to bring out to you one of my absolute favorite designs ever. As a matter of fact, the original custom version of this knife is a grail of mine that I have been chasing for well over a decade. And I'm finally able to hold one in my hands, carry it in my pocket, cut with it, play with it, flip it, do all that stuff with it, and know that I have it in my collection. That, of course, is the Korth Sentry. But this is the modern-day interpretation and the production version of that legendary design. But faithful to all of the dimensions of the original custom. So what we're looking at here is a Mech Force Knives collaboration with Rick Lala in this century. Now this particular variation right here in my hands is what they're calling the diamond plate pattern, as you can see from all the raised diamonds in the titanium, which by the way is so grippy and feels so, so good. There's also going to be a slightly more expensive version in a scroll work pattern. So you have the artistic scroll, which is about $425. And you have the diamond plate, which is going to be $410. So both are fairly affordable. Now, there are people out there that have never spent more than $50 on a pocket knife. So I understand where you're going $400, how is that affordable? It is when you consider, on the rare occasion, if you ever see an original Korth Sentry custom on the secondary market, you're going to be spending thousands upon thousands of dollars to get it. Now, initially, yes, from directly from the maker, they were thousands, but they have appreciated greatly in value. And there are a lot of different executions that were done as, you know, true customs are being one off or severely limited with the amazing carving in the titanium that, uh, that Rick Lala has done that makes each of those a standout knife. Now, before I die, I am going to find a way to own one of his carved centuries because especially now that I've handled this one for as long as I have, I've had this for a few weeks now, I know that I have to have a sentry. I absolutely have to have a custom sentry before I die. And I'm going to make that happen. Anyway, this will satiate me for now. <laughs> At least for now. Definitely one of my favorite designs overall. I love a nice sheep's foot, which is what you've got here in this blade shape. The incredible action, which we will be discussing in just a couple of minutes. The way that the ergonomics just melt this knife into your hand. 
choils where there should be and none where there shouldn't be. Everything from here back is very, very neutral. But yes, your index finger is going to be put in its place right there behind the flipper tab acting as a guard. You can choke up if you need to. You have enough room right up here. So if you're doing a little bit more carving, something that takes a little bit more strength and you want to get your thumb on the spine, then you're able to choke up there very, very easily. Because of the shape of the blade, this will work very well for indexing right up here and doing long slices with a pinch grip. So besides being a gorgeous looking knife, it is a very practical cutter as well. And MechForce has been knocking things out of the park. The quality level that we've seen them display is insane. One of my current favorite knives is this one right here, which I reviewed recently, which is the Apocalypse, where they teamed up with Alpha Hunter Tactical Design to create this. And it's in one of my favorite patterns with the, the 80s carbon fiber. It's a carbon ceramic uh, kind of material that's being used for the inlay in colors that I absolutely love because I am a child of the 80s. I was born in the mid-70s, so... The mid 80s was my, you know, that was, those were the formative years of my early childhood, which set up so many memories for me. So that particular color scheme really, really excites me. I'm a retro 80s person. And I love the work that MechForce has done so much that I have teamed up with them and they are going to be releasing my Hellraiser design. For those of you that have followed me for any length of time, you know that my most popular custom knife that I have made has been my Hellraiser model. And now it's going to be finally available in a flipper. Now, it's being held off just a little bit because as much as I love the prototype and as perfectly executed as it was, and many of you that went to Texas Blade Show had a chance to handle the knife, the prototype, and feel it, as great as it is, kind of wanted to go bigger and change a couple of very teeny tiny little things. So there will basically be, if things go as planned, a full size and then this one, which will be sort of the mini. But that's how impressed I was with their work that I absolutely had to work with them. And the knife that ultimately sold me on them when I realized these guys can do no wrong was this one right here the SOS that they did with Tashi. And this was my knife of the year for 2023. But we are here to focus on just one knife, the latest thing of perfection. And it's, it's I know that sounds like it's really, really hyping it up because I really don't like to use the word perfection. I have called very few knives perfect over the past 12 years that I've been reviewing them. And this is honestly one of them. It just, the, the balance of it feels great. The size of it is perfect. The action is silky smooth. The fact that you have multiple methods of deployment, you can use the flipper tab, you can use the thumb slot. You can reverse flick off the thumb slot. It's just a joy to operate. And it sounds great, too. Listen to this lockup. Yeah. And the part that I was really worried about, the pocket clip. Somehow they were able to execute this. Now, of course, it's not the crazy, full, hand-carved, thick pocket clip that we saw on the customs. But guys, this is a $400 knife, not a three dollars or $4,000 knife. So, you know, you have to put things into perspective. I was worried when I found out, I saw like a sneak peek initially, of just one little corner of it 
And I'm like, I know what that knife is. That's a sentry. There's no way around it. Their next knife is going to be a sentry. And I lost my mind and I reached out to, to the guys at Mech Force. I'm like, are you kidding me? They're like, no, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do the sentry. And we're excited about it. We think it's going to be great. And I got worried about how the pocket clip would be executed. I'm like, are they going to be able to do the snake? And yeah, I mean, for a production knife, you can only go so far. You can't do the craziness that you see in the hand-carved thick titanium clips of the custom. But this looks really cool. So the spirit of the Sentry is absolutely here. Let's talk about the specs very quickly. Let's get that open and lay it down right there. Again, as I mentioned before, they are faithful to the original size of the custom. The overall length is eight and a quarter inches with a blade length of three and a half inches. Blade steel is M390. The entire handle, backspacer, pocket clip, everything is made of 6AL4V titanium. The weight is 5.3 ounces. And of course, it's using IKBS bearings. Now, for those that know this knife, that know this maker, that makes a lot of sense. For those of you going, what do you mean, of course? What is IKBS and why would, why should I have known that? IKBS stands for Icoma Korth Bearing System. It was a bearing system developed expressly for knives. It was created by Flavio Icoma and the Lalas, also, nor, excuse me, also known as Korth Cutlery back in the day. And it's basically, you know, bearings set into a race. Now, bearings set into a race wasn't invented by these exceptional Brazilian knife makers, but adapting the idea into the specific system, the way that they've done it here and to be used for knives was created by them. And I believe the very first uses uh, and the reason why it was created or adapted into knives, I believe it was for balisongs. I believe the first ones were balisongs, but I could be wrong on that and forgive me if I am. Now, early on, the system was starting to catch on and because you got to realize folding knives at that time, flipper or not, and there really weren't flippers back then. I mean, Kit Carson had made a flipper or two. Um, there were a couple of guys that had, and they weren't, they weren't flippers like this. It was an idea of, I don't even know if I can short stroke this. No, I can't. It's going to go to full lock. It was just an idea of, I can hit this and it's going to pop the blade out a little bit. And then I can finish flicking it open. Those were all done on washers. Whether they were phosphor bronze washers or uh, nylon washers, they were always washers. Oh, it feels so good. So early on, as it started to catch on in popularity, if you were a knife maker and you wanted to do this bearing system, you wanted to use IKBS bearings, basically, you just had to ask permission because this was a registered name. It was a, it was a, a licensed product, basically. So you would submit a test knife to be approved. And if you're... I guess if your quality was worth it, I don't really know what the, what they judged everything on, but uh, once you were approved, it didn't cost you anything for the licensing, but you had to be approved to do it. And then somewhere on the blade, and it was usually chosen to be on the backside. Most makers put it right up there on the flats. You would have the IKBS logo, which we don't see that often anymore because honestly, nowadays, everyone and their brother seems to have some sort of bearing system there are a lot of different bearing systems out there. And while today's captive bearings are great and a lot easier for the knife makers to assemble, it was IKBS that started it all for the knife world. If you look right here at the logo, that really honestly is what IKBS is. It's a bunch of loose ball bearings that are set in there. And there's a, there's a tricky little way for you to do it as a knife maker. Um, I've watched several knife makers doing it, uh, sitting in their shops and, uh, I was sitting in Todd Begg's shop one day watching Todd, uh, assemble a knife. I don't remember what the knife was. 
And he was doing it like lightning fast. And I'm like, oh my God, IKBS, what a pain in the butt. How many, how many balls have you lost today? He's like, none. He goes, there's a simple way to do this. And it was by using grease. So you can use grease and then you can put the grease on your fingers or on a tool of some sort, whatever you want to pick up the, uh, the ball bearings with. I think he was using something, some tool, a hand tool of some sort. I don't remember what it was. So grease on it, pick up the ball, drop it in. You just kind of swipe it, you know, kind of wipe it in with the grease. You get all the balls in there and then it helps you put the balls in and then it holds the balls in there for you. Then you flip it over and you do the other side. You put the balls in the same way. Now, for those of you that don't want to have grease for lubrication in IKBS, you can do that and then you can flush it out. You know, you could use brake cleaner, you could use WD-40, whatever, hose it on down, pressure it all out, you know, use a, uh, use your air compressor or something, get it all out of there, and then drip in the lubricant that you would want to use. So, yeah, there's a little trick to it. And in the beginning, knife makers were having a hell of a time because they had these little teeny tiny, almost impossible to see balls all over the floors of their shops. And it was a challenge. But if you wanted to have that glass smooth operation without having to make everything to ridiculous tolerances, you wanted to use bearings. Now, that's not to say that the knife makers at the time that had switched over to IKBS weren't working with ridiculous, crazy tolerances. They were, because all of their knives were done with washers up until that point. It does give them a little bit of grace. Anyway, so to say that I am overjoyed to have this knife out here with me today would be an absolute understatement. I love everything about it. I have lusted after the century for so long, it's ridiculous. And I'm so happy that so many people will now have the opportunity to experience the amazing design work that goes into this knife because it really is awesome. And executed perfectly, the jipping on the flipper tab keeps your finger from flipping off of it and sliding off of it. It works really, really well. The raised gear pattern titanium backspacer feels really, really good in your hand and also helps you get that really solid purchase on there. You have a steel on steel lockup because you do have the steel lock bar insert that engages into the lock. You also have the over travel stop built into the lock bar as well. You can see it right there. And that prevents you from pushing the titanium lock bar over too far and damaging it. So everything was done properly on this knife. They took a legendary timeless design and created a much more affordable variation of that that will allow thousands of us to be able to own this incredible design. I could not be happier. I'm so stoked for MechForce, for Rick, and for everybody that's going to get one. I'm telling you right now, this will absolutely be a top favorite among collectors for 2024. Just the way the SOS became a monster favorite for people for 2023. And kicking things off at the very beginning of 2024, this was a monster hit. They sold out very, very quickly on every iteration of the Alpha Hunter Apocalypse. So as MechForce continues to dominate, what I'm happy to see is they're not going crazy with their prices. They're all staying relatively the same. They're in that low $400 range. They're not going up to five fifty, six, eight hundred dollars, and there are a couple of brands that have recently started doing that when they experienced a uh, a major surge in popularity. And I'm really glad to see that MechForce isn't doing that. Now, if they decided to put a damascus steel blade in here, by the way, guys, if you do, call me. I'm gonna want that one too. 
uh, <laughs> uh, if they were to put a damn steel blade in here, then yeah, then it would be, you know, a six, $700 knife because you're adding a material that in its raw form is a few hundred dollars more expensive. So of course it will elevate the price. But doing M390 and titanium in standard finishes, staying in that low $400 range, that is exactly where they need to be to hit that sweet spot for so many collectors out there right now that are buying into high-grade production folders. I'm really happy to see it. Anyway, that's it for me now on this one, guys. Thank you so much for joining me as always, and I'll see you on the next video.